Well, welcome to 2021. Does it feel any different than 2020? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. <laughs> Especially given all that we're going through. It's probably going to be pretty much like what I had, uh, what, uh, what I had a friend send me in Facebook. He, he reposted someone else's post. Um, mm -hmm. but he, the post basically said that 2021, 2021 feels pretty much like 2020 and pretty much like that song out of the 1960s, Henry VIII, where he says, Henry, I'm Henry VIII, I am, and then he finishes that first verse, and then he says, second verse, same as the first. <laughs> that was played a lot. It was just one verse song. And I'm afraid 2021 may be like that. And we're going to get through it just like we got through 2020 through the, through the, uh, the hand of God and His love and care for us. And that's something that I'd like, like us to think about uh, for a few minutes this morning. Our invitation song number 206 is going to be pretty much, maybe not our text, but our outline for the lesson this morning, Oh, Think of a Home Over There. This song was written in... 1868, so it's been around for maybe 150 years. It was written by a man uh, by the name of DeWitt Huntington. Uh, he was, uh, as you can see on the, on the screen here, maybe a little bit difficult to see, that's his picture. Uh, and that's his tombstone. Maybe a little odd that I would put his tombstone up uh, on, the, uh, on the PowerPoint, but his tombstone is kind of interesting. His tombstone is his obituary. Uh, it may be hard to read, but it has his name, DeWitt Clinton Huntington. He was born in Vermont in April of 1830. He died in Nebraska in February of 1912. He was a minister for the Methodist Episcopal Church denomination for 61 years, and for 10 years, he was chancellor of a, of a college, Nebraska Wesleyan University, that is attached to the Methodist Episcopal denomination. He was a rather famous individual. His uh, second wife is listed there on his tombstone. You don't see many tombstones like that. Uh, but that tells the story, at least the story he wanted told about him. You know, when you take a look at some of our, of our psalms and hymns in our, uh, in our uh, psalm book, sometimes there's a, an event that takes place that... that causes someone because of perhaps some grief or some loss uh, or something else to, to write a hymn. And there does not seem to be anything that like that in this case. There's, at least for posterity reason, we don't have any anything that would indicate that. But he did write this, this hymn, and this was a very popular hymn. This hymn, at least as of now, has appeared in over 429 hymnals in some form or other since he first penned it. And it's in our hymns, uh, hymnal, it was in Sacred Selections, it's in many, many others, most everybody uh, is probably very familiar with this song. So I'd like us to, to look at this song, look at the verses of this song, and think about some spiritual applications, because that is the point of our songs. And uh, in Ephesians and Colossians, Paul tells both congregations that we sing and make melody in our hearts, but we're also teaching and admonishing one another. So we have to make sure that the songs that we sing are scriptural, and when they are, I think this is a good example of a, of a hymn that is scriptural. I think it's also good for us to sometimes think about in a little more detail than just as we sing them, some of the spiritual truths found in those verses. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's move on and take a look at our first verse here. First verse, verse one is, Oh, think of a home over there, by the side of the river of light, where the saints, all immortal and fair, are robed in their garments of white. Do we do that? Do we spend time thinking about that home that awaits us over there? We should. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus tells us, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we're always thinking about the here and now, the 2020 and the 2021, that's where our heart's going to be, whether we intend it to be that way or not. 
Jesus is telling us that we need to be thinking about that home over there. Now, we, we cannot not think about the here and now. We live here. All right? We have to live and survive and exist in this, in this world. We were placed here by God, so we do have to have some time spent thinking about the affairs here. But if that's all we think about, and we don't think about that home over there, then our treasures will not be laid up over there. Our treasures will be laid up here. And this, this goes back to, to something I think about a lot now, the older I get. But when I was a, when I was a, a boy, I just could not wait to go up and visit my grandparents' house up in, in northwest Ohio. They had an 80-acre farm. They were retired at the time. They weren't farming it. But it didn't matter to me. There was 80 acres of fields and a wild area that had hills, and they just never plowed it under and tried to make it you know, fit for cultivation. There was a barn with a rope and hay, and we'd get out there. My cousins from Fort Wayne would come up, and we'd get out there, and we'd swing in the barn. They had chickens, which, you know, we'd go out and, and, and gather the eggs. They had, they had, one year, they had turkeys. They warned us not to go out there because they're mean, and they are mean. We found out they were mean. We couldn't really go out to the back 40 where we used to because the turkeys were in between us. They were great memories. And... It, I yearned, and when I knew that we were planning a trip, we would go up for the weekend, because it was about, about a four-hour trip from Indianapolis, I couldn't wait that whole week before my mind was on the fact that that weekend I was going to be up at my grandparents' house. And it affected my studies, but it was one of many things that affected my studies that week, I'm afraid. I couldn't wait. I just loved going up there. That's, I think, the idea of thinking of our home over there. That's what we need to be doing, not in terms of Grandma's house, but in terms of that eternal home that's waiting for us. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus tells us to think about that over there, and he tells us some things. He puts some things in our minds about what's waiting for us over there, where he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In First Corinthians, or sorry, in Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, Paul is telling us there how we really should be groaning in our spirit, earnestly desiring that our tent the building of God that's prepared for us, our spiritual body in that case, we should be looking forward to it, desiring that. When we read there, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed with mortality, so that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Do we groan? Do we just earnestly desire to the point where it kind of affects us in our desire for that home over there? That's what we see in, in Romans chapter 8. Paul again talking now to the Romans says the same thing. The creation groans for this redemption in verse 22, and that we should as well in verse 23. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until, our, uh, until now. Not only that, but we are also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but this hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? 
But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We see now in this passage how hope motivates us. It makes our longing for what has been promised to us so that we have that desire and to help us persevere through any trials, any tribulations, any problems, whether they be the normal type or whether they be the type that we are experiencing now with the COVID. Is that you? Is that me? Is that how we feel? And maybe can we see how that desire of that thinking of that home over there can help us get through? I hope so. Over in Revelation 21, starting in verse 22, we have a picture, actually really most all of chapter 21 and 22. We're just going to read a few verses out of each. But here we have an even, even more detailed picture of what awaits us in our home over there. Do we think about this? Is this what we look at and read and say, I just can't wait? Let's go and start reading in verse 22 of Revelation 21. But I saw no temple in it. Of course, this is the New Jerusalem. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are in it, are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Is its light. And the nations of those who are saved walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall be by no means enter into it anything that defiles, or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there, they, have, they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That's the picture that we are given the, in the final book of the revelation of God. That's what he's telling us waits for us. We need to be thinking about that home over there. Our second verse of our song reads, Oh, think of the saints over there, who before us the journey have trod of the songs that they bring on the air in their homes in the palace of God. You know, there are many reasons why we are given the Old Testament. One of them is to let us know that we are following in the footsteps of others that have gone on before us and to know that they were successful in their journeys. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the fact that when we look at the Old Testament and we read it, we are reading about faithful saints who were able to be pleasing to God. How many of us like to be first in anything? That means we're the leader. That means people are going to be watching us and seeing, you know, what we're doing. That helps them. It gives them confidence. Well, friends and brethren, the people, the faithful men and women of the Old Testament, they went first for us. And we can look at them and we can read about them, and that can give us some confidence, knowing that if they were able to do it, so can we. You know, I think I've told most of you, I just took a new job at Travelers. I, I used to do auto, now I'm doing property. And it's a little disconcerting when you just take on a new role, a new job, trying to learn all this new stuff and everything. Uh, and one thing that I know, we, there, there are others that are going through the training with, with me, and we, you know, all kind of express the same thing about, the, you know, how we're feeling and, you know, how we're just concerned, are we going to be able to do this? But we all end up saying the same thing. If there are others that have been able to do it, and there are, we can do it too. And that's really, I think, one of the big reasons, one of the big benefits of reading the Old Testament is looking at the stories of those people that were faithful to God, knowing that they were pleasing to God, they have gone on to their reward, and saying, if they can do it, so can I. At the transfiguration of Jesus, Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus in glory. They 
made it. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 11, Jesus says that many will come from the east and the west to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Those men made it. Now, those men and women, those are not presented here, but there were faithful women as well. Those that made it, they were not perfect, but they still made it. That should give us confidence. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 52 and 53, at the, at the death of Jesus, it says that the, that, the, that the graves were open and the saints, unnamed saints, were raised. And they went into the city of Jerusalem and many people saw them. I'm sure that was a shock. There were saints that were faithful to God and they still were pleasing to God, to God that God has accepted them into their home over there. In, you may have noticed this, but starting January 1st, we kind of changed the format of our reading. We had been reading, you know, chapters that were kind of associated with our Bible classes on Sunday and Wednesday. We're not going to do that anymore, at least not this, not this year. What we're doing is we're starting to go back into the Old Testament and the New, and we're going to be looking at accounts of faithful men and women that were pleasing to God and give us encouragement and comfort. So that's what our format's going to be. We're going to be reading about faithful men and women out of the Old Testament and the New. That's just want you to know that, and that's the point, or the purpose of that. It's this year to think about the fact that there is a home over there, there are others that, are ma that have made it, we're going to read about them, and we're going to be encouraged by them. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the writer of Hebrews, after he talks about that, that whole chapter, chapter 11, the chapter, what we call the chapter of faith, and he mentions all of these individuals that were faithful as they went through their lives, he says, we're surrounded by multitudes of people, just like us, that successfully live faithful to God, and they passed on to their reward. That's going to happen to us someday. We can do it, but we've got to think about that home over there if we're going to. But I want us to look at uh, and read a passage out of Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16, that kind of sums this up. It says there, starting in verse, 5, uh, verse 13 of Hebrews 11, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, or assured of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Remember Lot's wife? That was me putting that in there. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Think about those saints over there. Think about those that have trod on before and have been successful. They're over there waiting on us. We're waiting for us to join them. Verse 3 is going to look a little different than our verse 3. It says there, okay, there we go. It says, My Savior is now over there. There are my kindred and friends are at rest. That away from my sorrow and care, let me fly to the land of the blessed. Now, if you look at our song, boy. Verse 3 is, that's not verse 3. Verse 3 is what it's actually going to be in verse 4. As I said, this is, this is a song that's been around for almost 150 years. It's been in many hymnals. There are actually four verses to this song. Our song books don't include what is really verse 3. It's a scriptural verse, and I want us to think about this. It wasn't in Sacred Selections. I looked at an old copy of Sacred Selections. I saw it in there, but in our, our hymnal here, for some reason, they only have... Three verses they have omitted this one. But this is a good verse to think about as well. It's kind of similar to verse 2, but not quite. My Savior is not over there. There my kindred and friends are at rest. Think about that. The church in Thessalonica, we see this over in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, that the church there is concerned. There are, they know that, the, the, that Jesus has promised he's going to return, and yet some of the members of that congregation have died, and it's like, well, 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 well wait a second, they've died, what about them? Are they going to miss 
the return of Jesus. And, and Paul in this chapter then is telling them, no, that's not going to happen. And we're going to read a little bit about this. But as we do, let's remember two things. Number one, and we've already seen passages that, that teach this. John chapter 14 is one of them, that Jesus is going to come back and take us. And it doesn't matter whether we've passed on or not in this life. We all are going to be taken, those of us that are faithful. So we don't have to worry about it, that, that if we miss in terms of our lifetime the return of Jesus, that somehow we're going to, to miss that home over there. That's not the case. But I want us to understand that the church there, the brethren there, have concerns for brethren that had passed on. That's who their kindred are. More than anyone else, that's who their kindred are. Starting to read there, verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. These words should comfort us. The fact of the matter is that Jesus is going to come back and collect us. Whether we have passed away from this life or whether we're still alive, he's going to gather all of the faithful saints. Our brethren, all of us, will be taken up into that home over there. That's what Paul is trying to give us assurance of. We'll be joining Jesus. We'll also be joining our brethren, our kindred, our friends, in some cases our physical relatives, that were faithful to the Lord, our neighbors that were faithful to the Lord, those that were faithful to the Lord, those are going to be the ones that join us. Who do we want to see when we get into the new heavens and the new earth, when that is realized? Well, we clearly want family, my physical family. Not all of us have physical family that we can look at and say, well, they're faithful to the Lord, but some of us, some of us do. My mom's passed on. I want to see her. I want to see my grandparents on my dad's side, they were members of the church. My great-grandfather, my dad's grandfather, I have somewhat recently found out, maybe I was told this a long time ago and didn't, didn't remember it, but I just found out somewhat recently, I believe that he was a member, he was an elder, he was an elder of the Lord's church. That's kind of neat, because I am too. I'd like to meet him and talk with him. Our physical family, we want them to be there. Oftentimes, when we first become a Christian, Who's the first, first, who are the first folks we turn to to try to teach the gospel? If, if the gospel needs to be taught, it's, it's our family, isn't it? If we have found out we were lost and now can say, the first ones we normally would turn to would be our physical family to say, hey, let me tell you what I have just found out. Because we want them there too. But our real family and kin is not the physical family, it's our spiritual family. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 48 through 50, Jesus says, But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my brother, mother and brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Those that have fought the good fight of faith along and stood along our side with us, stood with us beside us, beside us when the world was persecuting us, and sometimes when our physical family was rejecting us, those are our kin that is talked about here in this third verse of this psalm. Matthew chapter 19, verses 28 and 29, Jesus again says to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that in the, gen in the regeneration, and that's what we're talking about here, in that home over there, in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses, or brothers or sisters, or fathers or mothers, or wife or children, or land for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Huntington here expresses the desire of the psalmist, David, who was mired in despair and anguish 
a false and treacherous brethren when he says in the 55th Psalm, My heart is severely pained within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me, fearfulness, trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, that I could fly away and be at rest. That's the desire that we have. That desire that we can go out and we can leave this world and go to the next one. If you take a look at the at the reading in the 55th Psalm, it talks about flying out to the wilderness. Well, that's all David could do. But we ourselves, we can go beyond to something much better than the wilderness, something that is much better than anything in this world, to that home over there. David wished to fly away. Do we have that feeling? Sometimes when we just say, you know, I've got family and friends here. I, 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 I love, I truly love dearly. But you know, I'd like to just go to that home over there right now. That's how David was feeling. Sometimes we should feel that way as well. Paul talks about that uh, in 2 Corinthians. It's better for him to remain here, but he also had that great desire to be with the Lord. So let's finally move on, or move on to our final verse. Our verse 3 in our psalm books, but the fourth verse, as it was written by Huntington, I'll soon be at home over there, for the end of my journey I see. All the saints and the angels up there are watching and waiting for me. In this final verse, Huntington turns to the one fact that all my mankind must face, and that is death. Our departure from this present age, death and judgment. Paul says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that the same fate awaits all men, that death comes, and then that accounting, that judgment, giving an account to God for the deeds of our lives. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, we see that Paul tells us that wise men who have set their priorities correctly are preparing for the future. Through that hope of the resurrection, wise men look towards, with eagerness, that home over there where he says, therefore do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Job expresses the same hope as he suffered, where he says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last in the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eye shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Someday we're going to leave this earth. And we're going to do it in two different ways. One or two. We can leave kicking and screaming, or we can leave with an expressed confidence and hope, not a hope that I, the way we use hope, I just hope this will happen, but the kind of hope that the Bible talks about, that is an earnest expectation, a reasonable expectation. You have prepared, and now you are going to have what you have prepared for revealed to you. That's the kind of confidence and hope that Bible, that's, that, that, that we see in the Bible, that we see from these men and women of faith from the Old Testament and from the New. We see this in, in, in Paul. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6-8, through 8, this, we believe, is the last letter, at least the last letter that he wrote that we have, uh, that he has written, and we can tell that he's getting ready for death. But we can see that he's not just getting ready right at the tail end here. He's been packing his bags, if you will, for many, many, many years. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is hand. I have fought the good fight. 
I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Therefore there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, or not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul didn't just pack his bags there at the last minute. Paul was packing his bag year after year after year after year. He was getting ready to make that journey so that here in 2 Timothy 4, he could say, my bags are packed. I'm ready. I don't, I don't, I, there's nothing else that I have to prepare for. I'm ready to go. And as far as we can tell from history, that his departure here in 2 Timothy 4 was indeed very, very close to the time that he wrote these letters, this letter to, to Timothy. He shared the same fate as all men and women, and that is we have to die. And then after that, the judgment. Are you prepared? for that journey to that home over there. We can sing about this song and have that great yearning, and we can have that earnest expectation of the groaning, desiring to be there, but if we're not really prepared, then we're not going to get that home over there. Each one of us needs to look within our hearts and ask ourselves, are we living right? Are we looking to the Word of God, reading it, putting it into practice in our lives, do we truly love Jesus the way Jesus wants us to love him? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Open to number 206. We're going to sing this song, and as we sing this song, and we sing about that home over there, if there's any, any doubt in anyone's mind as to whether they're ready to go and their bags are packed, do whatever needs to be done in your life to correct that. Come forward as we sing this. Oh, faith down the home over there.